From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. You placed a call to the Universal Adjustment Bureau in Hartford, Connecticut? Yes, I did. We have Mr. Pearson on the line now. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Hello? Johnny? Niles. Ben Abbott's rating with Dunn and Bradstreet is very good. He doesn't need any money. I still haven't determined if there was really an accident. Oh, and uh, no one seems to know what happened to Thomas Warner. Who's that? The trainer who was supposed to be with a horse when Abbott destroyed it. One his father called me from Baltimore. He doesn't know where he is either. Is that so? Something just occurred to me, Niles. What? Abbott's claim was filed over a week ago, yet he hasn't threatened to sue us or go to the insurance commission. Why, no. And that's usually pretty standard procedure with a man like Abbott. It is. If he has a just claim. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, San Pietro, California. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Universal Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Duke Red matter. I had a strong suspicion that the death of Duke Red, a racehorse, had not happened as reported. The one man who could possibly answer my questions was missing. He had left the Abbott Ranch in San Pietro without collecting a month's back pay and without telling anybody about his forwarding address. There, sir. Hi. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Kelly. Mr. Dollar, you can make this pretty hard for me. Mr. Abbott told me I shouldn't let you on the ground. Well, now, you didn't strike me as the kind of fellow who took that order too seriously. What do you want, sir? I want Thomas Warner, wherever he is. Well, he isn't here. I know that, Kelly. I want to find out where he is. Probably went home. I talked to his father in Baltimore. His father hasn't heard from him. Oh. Wouldn't you like to know where he is? Men come and go, Mr. Dollar. Your friend's with them for a little while, and you never hear from them again. I reckon that's the way we have to look at it. Now, maybe you better go now, Mr. Dollar. Suppose he didn't want to go without saying goodbye. Suppose he didn't have a choice. What do you mean? I mean a man doesn't pass up a month's pay just to make a fancy exit. We can't talk here, sir. Where did Thomas want to stay? He had a room off the stables, his own place. How about there? All right, Mr. Dollar. You... Wait for me, sir. I walked on down to the stables again and found the little apartment Thomas Warner had used for living quarters. The door was locked and I waited outside, looking over the workout tracks and the acres of rolling green turf that made Abbott Farms. A little while, Cully appeared. I shouldn't be doing this, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Abbott would skin me alive if he knew I was having any truck with you after that big row you had with him yesterday. Well, I'm not about to tell, Mr. Abbott, Kelly. I appreciate your help. This is where Mr. Warner stayed all the time he worked for Mr. Abbott. Uh-huh. You can see for yourself, it's all cleaned out, not a stitch left. Yeah. Did you happen to see Warner leave here that night? Right after the accident, he was gone. Mr. Abbott came up to the house about 9 o'clock. He told us all that Duke Red had been hurt, he had to shoot him, and that he had taken care of the rest. You mean destroying the carcass? Yes, sir. That's a pretty big job for one man. Well, I believe Dr. Gorey helped him with it, sir. He, he was with Mr. Abbott. Oh. Then Mr. Abbott told us that Mr. Warner was to blame for the accident and that Mr. Warner wasn't with us anymore. I wonder if any of the others saw him actually leave the premises. Well, now, we talked about that amongst ourselves. Nobody saw him go, Mr. Dollar. We thought it was kind of funny... Tom was a friendly, quiet sort of man, but he had a lot of friends here. Mm-hmm. It kind of disappointed us all, I guess. Did he have many things in this room? Clothes, mostly. He was a light traveler, Mr. Dollar. Horse training was just one thing. He worked on ships and in mining camps and lumber mills, I know that much, and he read a lot. Always seemed to be studying, finding himself. Did he have a temper? No, sir. No, sir. That's one thing Mr. Tom didn't have. Good horse trainer can't afford to have a temper. Even Mr. Abbott he could handle. All except that night, I guess. Mr. Abbott got powerful mad, I'm sure. Mr. Mr. Abbott is not an easy man to work for. 
How long have you been with him, Cully? 23 years, sir. We were together in Maryland before he moved the stables to California. His bad temper hasn't bothered you? Mr. Abbott was different than he is now. I mean, when Ms. Abbott was alive. But then when she died and raising Miss Terry, he hasn't had it so easy. I mean, easy with himself. You know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think so. I worry about Mr. Abbott, Mr. Dollar. He don't seem to run himself well sometimes. You know what I mean. Yeah. Maybe Duke Red being gone now will help. Mr. Abbott counted on that animal a lot. Counting on a racehorse is not just being anxious overnight or for a week, but being anxious for years, from the time they're colts to when they first step out. Now, he don't have that worry at all. Maybe it'll do him some good. What about his other horses? Them? Well, none of them like Duke Red. Not the same at all. They'll race and make money, but nothing like Duke Red. Yeah. Mr. Warner said he was a fine horse. Tell me, what kind of a car did Mr. Warner drive? Well, he didn't have a car, Mr. Dollar. How do you suppose he left here? He must have been carrying luggage. I reckon so. He could have lugged him out the highway and flagged himself a ride or waited for the bus. They come by all the time. Think he might have called a cab in town? Didn't use the house phone. Maybe the one down in the stable office. Maybe someone drove him in, Cully. Miss Terry might have, sir. Huh? Miss Terry drove Mr. Warner around now and then. Did Mr. Rabbit approve of that? No, sir. He did not. After my talk with Cully, I took a chance and hung around the stables trying to get a line on Thomas Warner. Ben Abbott's belligerent attitude seemed to permeate the whole farm. The horse handlers I talked with were grumbling and complaining. I was able to learn nothing from them. I decided to tackle Abbott himself again. He wasn't in, but his daughter was. Well, you came around just the right time, Mr. Dollar. We haven't had too much excitement around here all day long. I think they're supposed to toss you out on your ear when you show up. That should be interesting. Would you like a drink? No, not right now, thanks. Not right now, thanks. Now, isn't that the end, the bitter end? So precise, so efficient, so determined, so anxious to do a good job. To be a sober, steady, substantial expert bore. Now, what is it? Who are you mad at, Terry? Tom Warner? Why should I be mad at him? Horse trainer. Because he left and didn't say goodbye? Maybe. You know, when I first came in this house two days ago, you were arguing with your father. I couldn't help overhearing it. Was that about Tom Warner? Yes. Dad said he wasn't good enough for me. I'm all right now. Something else that day. That business you were telling me about before. It'll have to be looked into. Why, for heaven's sake? Because you intimated that your father and Dr. Gorey might be lying about the whole thing? Do you realize that if there's any truth to it, your father would be liable for criminal charges? I know. I was just trying to put Dad in a bad light with you. It was just for good, old-fashioned, first-class spite. Him telling me about not seeing Tom and all. We've been arguing for weeks about it. When I saw you the other day, I thought it was a good chance to get back at Dad. I see. Tell me about the trouble over Warner. Why tell you? Well, let's say I'm an interested party. I like you, Terry. Well, Tom and I saw quite a bit of each other, and Dad never liked it. I suppose because I'm all he has left. Mother and Bob, he was my older brother, were killed in an airplane accident a few years ago. Dad's always expected me to marry one of the Long Island horses, he said. The turf, something, I don't know. Anything but a horse trainer. He's been looking for an excuse to get rid of Tom. Your father doesn't strike me as the kind of man who'd have to give an excuse to fire someone he didn't want around. Well, he found an excuse. He blamed the accident on Tom. Do you think he's mad? What's that? Nothing. Do you suppose your father will ever calm down so I can talk to him? I don't know. The Abbots have always been a terribly angry group of people, very emotional... There doesn't seem to be much of a let-up these days. Terry, is that what you meant when you asked me if I thought your father was mad? I suppose so. It's almost as if he's been on the verge of, of something lately, something desperate. His moods frighten me sometimes. They didn't used to. I, I don't easily frighten. But looking back, two years ago, Daddy bought a new car. We were out driving one day right after he bought it, and something went wrong. 
the gear shifter, some little thing. Well, Daddy was so angry, he, he just backed the car up and smashed it into a cement wall and left it. That was when he first frightened me, the first time that I can remember. Have you been frightened much? Since then? Oh, yes, many times. That's why Tom was so nice to have around. He, he never became angry. Never did things like that. Like the men, the men I know. Tom sat quietly, and he let me sit beside him, reading, talking. I'm not that kind, really, of course, but I, I liked it with Tom. I liked it very much. You asked me about him, Johnny. Well, I'll tell you. If he'd come to say goodbye to me, there would have been no goodbye. I would have gone away with him anywhere. I was in love with him from the first day he came to work here. I still am. I always will be. Well, that's all there is to tell. Did he know this, Terry? Yes. And he knew I meant it. I do. Hi. What can I do for you? Constable in. I'm in. I'm the constable. Tad Polk. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm from Hartford. Mm-hmm. What's your trouble, Mr. Dollar? Well, I'm worried, I guess, Mr. Polk. I, I walked around for a long time before I came in here. Yeah. Sit down. And hardly anybody drops in this time of night, unless they're drunk. How about you? Nope. No, didn't think so. Mr. Polk, I'm an insurance investigator. I've been in San Pietro three days now, trying to get the facts about a claim filed by Benjamin Abbott. Mm-hmm. I suppose about his horse, Duke Red. That's right, Mr. Polk. I can't seem to locate a man named Warner, Thomas Warner. Worked as a trainer for Abbott up until the day of the accident. Go ahead, sir. Warner and Abbott had an argument over the accident. Warner left. He was fired. His folks in Baltimore haven't heard from him, and they're worried. I can't seem to get a line on him myself, and I need to talk to him. Yes, well, what exactly do you want me to do for you, son? Help me find him. You sure he's missing? He isn't around. You want to make out a missing persons complaint, that it? I suppose so, yes. Yes, all right. Now, you just sign here. All right. There. You guarantee results? I might surprise you, mister. I'll let you know what happens. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... Well, it all hinges on a decent man who knows he's loved and never said goodbye. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>